and its arguments. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. You are the appellant, and you do plan to reserve time. Please let me know when you come to the podium, because I will be keeping track of the time for you, and I'll try to keep you apprised of when you get any close to your rebuttal time. The arguments are being visually and audibly recorded to be posted online, so keep your voices up and remain behind the podium. Um, I'm not going to admonish you about using the names of children or minors, because I don't think that's applicable to our first argument. We have read your brief, and we are ready to proceed when you are. Thank you. Well, that, I believe that's you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I would like to reserve three minutes. Good morning, Your Honors. Jeremy Blatt on behalf of Appellant John William Cruz in this matter. As the court is well aware, Mr. Cruz pled through via an Alford plea to uh, arson-related charges in this matter. About an hour after his plea was entered, he sought to withdraw that plea and that request was denied. He was thereafter sentenced by the court. The error in this case, the denial of his request to withdraw his plea, has implications not just in this case, but because of its circumstances, it shows, you know, it relates back to a fundamental systemic view of our justice system and how it operates. The, the trial court's stated reason for denying his plea was made, was stated, before he was even given an opportunity to make a statement regarding his request to withdraw his plea. His counsel said, after about an hour break, a lunch break, Mr. Cruz wants to withdraw his plea, and before any argument was allowed to be presented or any discussion with Mr. Cruz was made, the trial court had already denied that request. Prior to sentencing, it's fundamental that you can withdraw your plea. It's the, while the trial court has an abuse, while the standard is abuse of discretion and the trial court has great leniency in whether or not to grant that request, the system is still designed and the rules regarding this are still designed that the defendant is to be given more leeway in being allowed to withdraw his plea at that time. Because without an extended period of time having taken part, or sentence having been imposed, and the defendant going, oh gosh, this is worse than what I thought it was going to be, the defendant has the opportunity to say, I am making a mistake. And if there's worse consequences coming, I'm willing to take that on. Counsel, uh, would you agree that the case law provides that there can't be a change of mind, even with the in the traditional circumstance, if it was a guilty plea and we had gone through all of this, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. But where you come to this particular circumstance, where this case, this case is different from so many other cases that are out there, I don't think that that rule applies in the same way. Because this wasn't just a change of mind. This was, I mean, even during the time of his plea being entered, he was wrestling with exactly what to do. He was maintaining his innocence while even pleading. He was making it clear that he wasn't doing this as in other cases where he was trying to avoid a harsher punishment. He, he stated that throughout this process. His, he stated his reluctance about pleading even as he was doing it. And, and even if that were the case, in this particular circumstance, there wasn't a need for the trial, the trial court's in final reason for denying his request. Well, the jury's already gone. Well, this was a lunch break. There was no reason for the jury to be gone. The court's, the trial court's convenience, okay, he entered a plea, let's, I mean, everybody who's taken part in a trial knows if you hold over an hour, 
a defendant might change, a defendant might realize what it is they're doing, might have a different, something might come up. So you're suggesting, counsel, is that a trial court can never rely on a defendant's plea? No, I think the trial court can rely on a defendant's plea. But this... So how did the trial court do anything wrong here in releasing the jury? This is not your traditional circumstance where a defendant enters a plea of guilty, acknowledging their conduct, and you proceed forth from there. This was a circumstance where, throughout this process, the defendant was maintaining his innocence, was maintaining a hesitation in what he was doing. The problem arises when somebody looking from the outside, this defendant looking at his rights, because our Bill of Rights is designed to enhance the ability of our citizens and to restrict the state and its actors in whatever position they may be. This defendant expresses his hesitation throughout. This defendant is not attempting to short-circuit the system. This defendant is not like the cases that I've cited where an attempt to withdraw a plea is validly denied because time has passed, because the person is making claims that are unsubstantiated, because the person is engaging in their own bad conduct to short-circuit the system or not show up for sentencing or not take part in sentencing. Mr. Cruz was compliant throughout, expressed his hesitations throughout. When he comes back up after such a short period of time under these circumstances, which are not the norm, to simply deny his request, whether out of convenience or whatever, but to especially express that denial before he or his attorney have a chance to state a reason or show any indication of why, we are now in a position to where this defendant and anybody looking from the outside would go, wait a minute, he's not even being given a chance. The system's not even working in this regard because before he has a chance to express himself, before his attorney has a chance to present an argument, before the trial court even inquires of them of what is going on, the trial court has already said, no, I don't see a change of circumstance. Well, counsel, refresh my recollection as to what the record reflects. When he decided to plead, did the court have any of the trial taking place? Was the jury in panel? Yes. So he wants to plead, and what has happened up to that point? Two adult witnesses who were in the house at the time of the event had testified. There had been some additional non-lay testimony. The core of the forensic testimony and potential DNA testimony had not been presented. Okay, and it's my understanding that he makes a statement when he has either gone through the colloquy with the court on his change of plea or at some point makes a statement that is, I might as well plead because I'm going to lose, or is it close to that? At that point, the DNA had not come out. There was reference to that by both he and his attorney. And I'm sure his attorney would have informed him of what the state had in terms of evidence on the case. There was not a clear statement by his attorney that it would conclusively tie him, but it's a presumption that everybody was clearly working off of. I mean, the record, in honesty, the record reflects that. And then nothing else obviously happens after he indicates he wants to change his plea in the trial scenario. Correct. I'm trying to get a flavor for is this, I'm sitting here, I see the trial's not going very well for me, I want to change my plea, and then anything else happening between that and the time I want to withdraw my plea and proceed with the trial? They had taken a lunch break, and when they returned, his trial counsel indicates that they had had further discussions. There's no 
There's no discussion on the record, at least, of whether any of the subsequent state witnesses um, were still available if they had been released. The witnesses who had testified, in terms of the lay witnesses, um, they had, they were obviously still available because they, they spoke at sentencing. Um, so from that, I guess you can make the presumption any other lay witnesses were still available. Okay. And I just trying to understand exactly what's actually in the record about what may or may not have happened during that period. But you've indicated and answered the question. So, thank you. Yeah. And, and I did just speak on one thing. Uh, when it comes to the forensic testimony, there was the one BCI analyst who uh, was able to testify about the volatile material that they found, but she could only testify as to the general class. Kind of work with chemical engineer, I understand what she was talking about. Um, but it was not something that tied directly. That testimony did not tie directly to the defendant. Um, it just tied to a particular class of materials that the alleged accelerant would fall into, but it was not like this is the specific accelerant. Um, regard, regardless, the point in this is, is, unlike other cases where the defendant gives that firm commitment of I am pleading guilty, I am taking responsibility, um, I am admitting to doing this kind. In this case, where a defendant has such inherent hesitation, to simply deny that request before even inquiring of him why, he's, why he or his attorney are now up there saying we want to withdraw our plea, creates a fundamental problem. Even after the, court, the trial court hears from them after that, when the trial court makes the same decision, says, yeah, it's just, you're changing your mind, whatever, the problem is, is we've already under circumstance where the trial court, before allowing the defendant to speak up for his own rights, for his own defense in this regard, his own choice of, you know, if there are worse consequences, I'll take it. Before giving him that chance, the trial court has already said no. And then the trial court's final stated reason was, an hour's passed and I've let the defendant go. When everybody else is available. Counsel, are you suggesting we should apply a different standard of review to a withdrawal of a Alfred plea than a withdrawal of a guilty plea? I think that when you look at an abuse of discretion, you have to look at the defendant's conduct in how it goes and how you approach that circumstance. When you look at the factors of why are we how are we evaluating that abuse of discretion? You have to look at, did the trial court act reasonably? And it's not reasonable for a trial court to deny a request before allowing the defendant to even give a basis for that request. And thank you. Because the defendant has not met his burden of showing that he had a reasonable and legitimate basis for withdrawing his guilty plea. Although pre-sentencing motions to withdraw guilty pleas are to be freely and liberally granted, uh, pursuant to State versus Z, if that case also says that there's no absolute right to withdraw your guilty plea, even if it is before sentencing. And finally, because the trial court did not abuse its discretion in denying Mr. Cruz's motion to withdraw his Alfred plea. With regard to the standard of review, it is an abuse of discretion because an Alfred plea is just a species of a guilty plea. So generally when someone's entering an Alfred plea, they're doing so because they do not want to take the risk of a trial. Could be because they want a lesser penalty, but generally it's because they see basically the writing's on the wall. In this case, as um, opposing counsel indicated, two of the individuals who were in the home where the arson um, started testify in the trial, and then the fire marshal had also offered testimony. At that point, uh, Cruz indicated that he was going to be found guilty anyway, so he wanted to enter an Alfred plea, and that was done. When you're examining whether a Alfred plea has been entered knowingly and intelligently, uh, State versus PSL sets forth the standard of review for that and sets forth five factors for the court to look at. 
First, whether the plea was the result of coercion, deception, or intimidation, which there's no indication or any allegation that that made in this case. Second, whether the defendant had an attorney present at the time of the plea, which he did. And third, whether the attorney's advice was competent, um, which the trial court found it was, and there's been no argument otherwise um, set forth by Mr. Cruz. Fourth, whether the plea was made with an understanding of the charge, and there's no, um, there's nothing in this record to indicate that Mr. Cruz had um, any lack of knowledge as to the fact that he was pleading to two counts of aggravated arson and whatever the penalties were. And finally, whether the defendant was motivated by a desire to seek a lesser penalty or fear of the consequences of trial or both. And the record in this case supports the finding of the trial court that in this case, Mr. Cruz thought that he was going to be found guilty based on the fact that there was lighter fluid that was used in the fire, there was a bottle of lighter fluid found in the yard, and there was going to be DNA evidence to link him to the uh, bottle of lighter, lighter fluid. With regard to whether a trial court has abused its discretion in denying a motion to withdraw an Albert plea, uh, this court has set forth a standard for that in State versus Stokar and set forth nine factors. The first of which is whether there's prejudice to the state. In this case, there would be prejudice to the state because as Judge Council had indicated during questioning of co -co opposing counsel, the jury in this case had been impaneled and had been discharged. So regardless of the fact that only an hour had passed, the jury was discharged. So whether the witnesses were still available is really not relevant to the inquiry of this first factor. The fact is that uh, Jeopardy would have attached at this point and it would have been a burden otherwise to have restarted the trial. We, there is absolutely no indication that anything happened during that one hour break other than Mr. Cruz started to question um, his decision. And that is not a basis for withdrawing a guilty plea regardless of whether it is be, um, before sentencing or after. But counsel, the argument is I think that um, he wasn't given an opportunity to explain to the judge. So right. how can we fault him for not showing these things if he wasn't given that opportunity? So in those factors, um, one of the factors out of the nine is the extent of which there was a hearing um, on the motion to withdraw. And in this case, the state would argue there's no need to have a hearing because if only an hour had passed. The indication was basically he's changed his mind. The court did give counsel and the defendant that opportunity to speak, and frankly, they did not set forth anything other than he changed his mind. So therefore, there was no reason to have an entire hearing. Um, the fact that Mr. Cruz maybe wanted more time to tell the court his basis is, is really irrelevant here because the fact is he had just simply changed his mind. Even, even at this point in the oral argument and in the briefs, there's been no basis articulated for his reason to withdraw his plea other than he simply changed his mind, which is not a valid reason and would put um, a big burden on, on the courts if every time someone simply changed their mind, the plea was to be withdrawn. That would kind of put the judicial system to a pretty, pretty big halt. Um, the other the other factors are whether um, the client was represented by counsel, which Mr. Cruz was. His uh, the plea hearing, which in this case there's no doubt that he had a um, appropriate hearing at the time of his plea, and he does not dispute that in his brief. Um, some of the other factors regarding that are the reasonableness of the time to withdraw. Here, just an hour and a half. There's not enough time for anything to have changed that um, was developed during the questioning. In oral argument today, there's absolutely nothing that had happened other than a lunch break, came in for sentencing, and then, again, he just simply wanted to change his mind, again, not setting forth a basis that would be adequate pursuant to any of the case law. Um, the reason for the motion, again, is simply that he changed his mind. At this point, um, an Albert plea is something you enter into when you're, you're still saying, you know, you didn't do it, but you realize that you're going to be found guilty. So this is very typical of every Albert plea. So when counsel talks about how this is not a normal situation, it may be atypical if this was a guilty plea, but it wasn't a guilty plea, it was an Alfred plea, and therefore it is subject to the, this review of the nine factors that are set forth in Stokar. Um, again, um, the other factors are whether counsel understood the, what he was uh, entering a plea into, um, what Mr. Cruz understood as far as the plea he entered into, which he did, and whether he had um, an adequate defense or he was not guilty. And there's absolutely nothing in the record to show that he had a defense or that he would not have been found guilty. To the contrary, the evidence that had been introduced into trial at that point shows that he would have been found guilty because, again, there was that bottle of lighter fluid, there was testimony that the lighter fluid was the accelerant that was used in the arson, and that there would be testimony as to his DNA being on 
not a light of good. Now he had some um, explanation uh, as to why his DNA was on the lighter fluid, which I think any juror would have disregarded, which was that he had been in the yard at some point and had possibly urinated on that bottle. So when you take that evidence into consideration, um, the state would argue that the defendant has not met his burden of showing that he had a reasonable and legitimate basis to make on his plea, that you're not entitled as a defendant, even if this pre-sentencing, to an absolute right to withdraw your plea, and that based on the factors set forth in Stobart, the defendant in this case um, has not set forth a basis to show that the trial court abused his discretion in denying his motion to withdraw his Alfred plea. And if there's no questions, I would rest on my feet. State finished with um, an analysis of how Mr. Cruz would have been found guilty, how any testimony he would have presented, presented or they're assuming he would have been presented, would have been disregarded by the jury, etc. These are factual statements that there is that are relevant to this, in that there, this evidence was not presented. And while the participants in this case at trial might say, well, you know. We think he would have been found guilty, and his attorney's telling him he would have been found guilty. The reality of it is, is every attorney sitting in this room has sat in a case where everybody was like, they're going to be found guilty, and that didn't happen. Or they're going to be found not guilty, and the person was found guilty. So to the extent that the state has made these arguments, those don't matter. The state's argument that every time a defendant changes, the court should be subject, is not subject to the defendant, defendants just changing their mind, and the burden would be on the court. Case law shows that their statement is already true. Even the cases that are cited in our brief show that whether due to period of time, defendant conduct, um, participation in pre-sentence proceedings, etc., a change of mind is not the issue in this case. It is about the time frame, and it is about the um, trial court not allowing Mr. Cruz to even present an argument on his behalf before a decision has been made. And that is an abuse of discretion, especially when, during his sentencing, or not the sentencing, his initial plea, his stated reason, one of his stated reasons for plea, for making the Alfred plea was that he would not be able to prove his own innocence. He entered that Alfred plea in part because not just, oh, they've got this evidence, but because he believed he had an obligation to prove his own innocence, which is contrary to our Constitution, contrary to the fundamental tenet of our court systems, the trial court and his counsel never corrected that, and that was one of his stated reasons for entering an Alfred plea. This was an individual who entered this plea not to avoid punishment. That was made clear in his plea, that was made clear when sentencing came and he was finally given an opportunity to speak for himself. He was not trying to game the system. He was not trying to play the system. He was attempting to reconcile his potential decisions with a fundamental misunderstanding 